Now that we have introduced both p-values and hypothesis tests, we need to spend a little time grappling with the problem of multiple comparisons. As you browse the pages of today's top medical journals, you will undoubtedly encounter multiple p-values and tests of hypotheses in virtually any original research article that you examine. Tables like the ones shown here from an NEJM article are not at all uncommon. There are actually 19 p-values in the highlighted column and multiple tables similar to this one throughout the article. That's not to say that there is anything wrong with this particular article. In fact, it's quite an outstanding article. However, when multiple tests of hypotheses are conducted, more than 5% of them are very likely to be statistically significant purely by chance. As we discussed earlier in this module, when we set the level of significance to 0.05 for a single hypothesis test, approximately 5% of the time, we will reject a true null hypothesis just by chance. What if we conduct multiple independent hypothesis tests? The chance of making a type 1 error will be greater than 5%. We can quantify the proliferation of type 1 errors. Let's assume that we are conducting multiple independent hypothesis tests at the 0.05 level of significance, and in actuality, all of the null hypotheses we are testing are in fact true. As the number of independent null hypotheses tested increases, the chance that one or more of those true null hypotheses will be incorrectly rejected also increases. For two independent null hypotheses tested, the chance of rejecting one or both of the hypotheses is 10%. For 10 hypotheses, the chance of rejecting one or more of the true null hypotheses is a whopping 40%. The third row in this table displays the alpha level, what I am calling alpha star, needed to be used for each individual test in order to maintain an overall 0.05 level of significance across all of the comparisons. The size of the individual alpha level required decreases dramatically as the number of tests increases, resulting in the need for extremely small p-values in order to reject any individual hypothesis. The most problematic situation is what is generally referred to as a fishing expedition. A group of clinical investigators conduct a research study that collects hundreds or maybe even thousands of variables on a sample of patients. With a rich data set in hand, they set out indiscriminately examining variables and conducting hypothesis tests, with the expectation that this endeavor may yield a bountiful harvest of meaningful scientific results. However, this kind of fishing expedition can often have unexpected complications the proliferation of type 1 error can lead to spurious results justified by unprincipled explanations that cannot be independently verified. Ultimately, the failure to give careful consideration to these issues at the outset of the research project can have important implications downstream for the integrity of this entire scientific endeavor. So how does one control type 1 errors? There are a multitude of procedures for adjusting the significance level of hypothesis tests to preserve overall type 1 error rates. The most simple and direct approach is the Bonferroni method. Simply divide the significance level used by the number of comparisons conducted. Say for example, you were planning to test three independent null hypotheses using a 0.05 level test. Simply divide 0.05 by 3 and use the resulting significance level of 0.017 for each hypothesis test. This is a standard approach that is commonly seen in the literature because of the ease with which it can be implemented. However, use of the Bonferroni method becomes extremely conservative as the number of tests considered increases. Extremely conservative in this context means that it becomes more difficult than it should be to reject any individual null hypothesis. There are a number of areas where special 
adjustments are made and I want to mention just one of those situations as an example interim analyses this refers to the practice of conducting hypothesis tests during the course of the study while subjects are being accrued and before the final sample size has been achieved this approach is particularly common with drug trials and is used to determine if there are substantial enough treatment differences during accrual to abandon the randomization and provide the treatment to all subjects being enrolled in the trial. There are a variety of specially developed approaches for addressing the issue of multiple comparisons for interim analyses. Returning briefly to the NEJM article table that I showed you earlier let me draw your attention to the footnote of the table where the authors have indicated the use of a Bonferroni adjustment to aid the reader in interpreting the results shown in the table. Notice that the p-value column in the table provides the actual p-values and the footnote provi provides Bonferroni adjusted significance level that should be used to reject any individual hypothesis test. Thus, any p-value that is less than 0.001 would be considered statistically significant under the Bonferroni adjustment. This presentation is appealing because it provides both the actual p-value and the adjusted significance level p-value cutoff. This is much more informative than simply stating whether each p-value is statistically significant or not. Does this mean that we are destined to spend our research lives obsessed with alpha, keeping track of every hypothesis test we conduct to ensure we have the proper adjustment? Fortunately, this is not the case. It is important both as a clinical researcher planning a scientific investigation and a scientific reviewer for a journal to be aware and carefully consider multiple comparison issues. Although there is great breadth and depth to this issue, there are a few general conceptual guidelines that obviate the need in many circumstances to become embroiled in the details of mathematical alpha adjustment. When planning a scientific investigation, it's important to prioritize the importance of the different hypotheses to be analyzed. Hypotheses can be categorized as confirmatory or primary, supportive or secondary, or exploratory, also called post hoc. This figure is taken from a 2008 article by Moyer, a statistician who describes a disciplined approach advocated by many in the clinical research community to statistical analyses. He first categorizes endpoints as those that are prospective and formulated prior to initiation of the study, and those that are post hoc. He further breaks down prospective endpoints into those that are primary or confirmatory and those that are secondary or supportive endpoints. If there is more than one primary endpoint, then the investigator should be concerned with type 1 error allocation and ensure that the FWER or family-wise error rate is maintained for the family of primary comparisons, usually maintaining an FWER of 0.05. These primary endpoints are considered confirmatory and are the primary goal of the scientific investigation. Secondary endpoints that are supportive of the primary endpoints should be tested at the nominal level, meaning that a standard 0.05 significance level would be used. However, the results of secondary endpoints should be interpreted in the, in the context of being supportive to the primary endpoints and treated as such. All other analyses are considered post hoc or exploratory and are tested at nominal levels as well. These analyses would be interpreted with careful consideration for their post hoc and exploratory nature. Thus, significant exploratory results would carry much less weight than supportive or confirmatory results when described in a research article. The weight of evidence for the primary conclusions of the study should rely primarily on the confirmatory endpoints selected for the study. The use of this disciplined approach to analysis is primarily intended for use in randomized clinical trials. When we move outside of this framework into observational studies, 
The use of disciplined analyses and handling of multiple comparison issues is less clear and more complicated. In general, it probably makes the most sense to focus concern primarily on confirmatory analyses and randomized trials. Certainly, it makes sense in any context to be aware of multiple comparison issues and scrutinize research reports that utilize hypothesis testing indiscriminately like a machine gunner at target practice. I also think it bears repeating again that to the extent possible, interpretation of any result should begin and not end with a conclusion of statistical significance. Once a result is deemed statistically significant, it should be scrutinized and interpreted within the proper context with consideration given to statistical issues, research design issues, other research results, and existing clinical knowledge. Let's end this section with a few general recommendations. First, say what you plan to do, then do what you say. The disciplined approach advocated is intuitively appealing and avoids the need to engage in complicated mathematical adjustments for multiple testing except for the primary outcomes. Be careful when using the term significant. As we have discussed, this is a loaded term that is often misinterpreted as meaning the results are clinically significant rather than just being statistically significant. Report actual p-values. Use p-values and confidence intervals together. Lastly, think beyond 0.05 and interpret results in context. This concludes our discussion of multiple comparison issues.